Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's class for caregivers. My name is Lindsay Vajpai. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for Insight Memory Care Center. If you're new to Insight Memory Care Center, we are a nonprofit organization based in Northern Virginia. Our mission is to provide specialized care, support, and education for individuals living with Alzheimer's disease and other memory impairments, their families, their caregivers, and the community through our Adult Day Health and Resource Center. Our vision is a community where those affected by Alzheimer's and other memory impairments can achieve the highest quality of life. Today's webinar is part of our monthly classes for caregivers. These classes are geared towards family caregivers who care for a loved one at home. Classes are held each month on the second Wednesday from 1 o'clock until 3 p.m. Eastern Time. They're free and open to the public. To learn more about our organization or find our upcoming classes, you can visit us at insightmcc.org. And now I'd like to introduce today's presenter. This is Pamela Mills. She's a dementia specialist and educator, as well as a care manager with the Option Group, Corwood Care, and Enriching Connections. Pamela is really special because she's got over 25 years of experience in the aging services field with a specialty in assisting people with dementia to live well. So welcome, Pamela. Hi, I'm so happy to be able to be here. You know, Every time I see people talk about like how long I've been in the field, it makes me feel old, but I know we started, I was very young, so it's all good. Um, but yeah, I actually started working in uh, residential communities when I was 15 years old. So actually up to more than 30 years now, but I'm so happy to be here with Insight Memory. Uh, I mean, a wonderful, wonderful organization uh, that I've known Lindsay for years and I feel really special to be able to be a part of this program and assist. So today we are going to be talking about the art of engagement and activities. So I'm gonna set up my little screen share here and here we are. Okay, so today we're talking about the art of activities and engagement, uh, also known as connecting with people living with cognitive change or living with dementia. So again, here's a little bit about me. I'm a dementia specialist and a care manager. I currently work with three organizations, including the Option Group, Corwood Care, and my own organization, Enriching Connections. And so I've been uh, a dementia specialist for many years, uh, exclusively with my master's of arts degree from the Erickson School in the Management of Aging Services, as well as uh, many years just direct hands-on experience assisting people living with cognitive change, which is truly my number one love. I just love working with individuals who are going through this experience and helping them live their best life with dementia. So what is engagement? Uh, you know, we hear that term all the time, uh, living an engaged life or being engaged in an activity. It's not about marriage. <laughs> it's not a that step before marriage. Um, the yes, also engagement, but something different. So engagement, if I was gonna define it, I would really call it being with, being with somebody. And I try to, um, really emphasize that with part, because when it comes to living with cognitive change or living with dementia, well, sometimes here people talk about, I'm doing something for the person or worst case scenario, I'm doing something to a person, something that should never happen. We should not do something to a person ever. Um, we should always be with that person. Uh, and, and assist them by creating that partnership, that caregiving partnership, that uh, partners in caregiving that talks about having somebody who is a caregiver and a care receiver. We never ever want to discount the person living with cognitive change. We want to always include them. And so the terminology with or being with is duly inclusive. So when we talk about people, human beings overall. I mean, every person 
is um, a human being and human beings overall are a social species. And so it's really important for us to recognize that humans are you know, social. We need connection to thrive. We need each other. Uh, we, we talk about how, um, and particularly after this COVID year, how difficult it was to quarantine or isolate or be away from those that we loved. And when you look at what happened, particularly among populations of people that were living with cognitive change, we saw a significant amount of decline through the population of people who were living with cognitive change, who had to isolate, who had to maybe stay in their homes uh, more often, who lost their connections to wonderful programs like Insight Memory um, or other so social day programs or other adult day medical programs or support groups or support networks. When we had to, to be more um, away from those resources, we tended to see a lot more decline. And so it's important to recognize how much a connection in being with other people, uh, particularly people that are a positive influence, a loving and caring, supportive influence on that person's life is so important for their overall health, their overall well-being and helping each person thrive. So connection, what is connection? It's purposely using time to build a relationship with each person. So as a, a person who connects well with people who are living with cognitive change or living with dementia, I've noticed there are so many different ways to connect. And the best way to connect is through truly getting to know that person. Uh, the Alzheimer's Association has a saying is you've met one person with Alzheimer's or dementia, you have met one person. And so I'm a person-centered professional who believes that every person living with cognitive change matters, their voice, their, their interests, their preferences, their needs, who they are, their story is such an important part of uh, their care. And so pro providing that connection, that opportunity for truly getting to know each person individually is an essential part of having successful, supportive, and overall healthful care for an individual living with cognitive change. And that begins with valuing that individual and purposely choosing to be in relationship with that individual and learning all about them. That's connection. And that connection is what makes uh, all relationships thrive and all types of interactions and care thrive. So connection is framing the day in ways that the person can be seen, can be heard, and can be valued simply for the sake of who they are. Cognitive change can limit a person's ability. Uh, as we all know, for those of us who are living with somebody with cognitive change in our lives, whether that person is living in our home uh, or if we are a caregiver in another state with somebody, um, wherever you are in that person's life, we know that these um, disorders, these diseases of dementia can really limit a person's um, physical ability to connect to understand the world around them. It changes the brain so much. And the brain as an organ is an integral part of helping a person, each person connect to the world around them, to understand uh, the words that people are saying, to socially connect, to have social skills, to have the words and the thoughts and the abilities to function in life itself. And so the decline that is often caused through the different types of cognitive change that there are, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or Lewy body or frontal temporal lobe, 
dementia or Wernicke-Kosakoff, whatever the disorder is, um, will limit a person's capability to interact in the world around them, uh, around them in certain ways. And, and I call that bridge burning. And um, that's where the person loses that ability to connect to the world around them because of that disorder. So as I mentioned that humans are social animals and as we saw during the COVID year, as well as you know, all throughout times where people living with cognitive change have a more difficult time connecting to the world around them because of the disorder and their symptoms, uh, we tend to see uh, more of a challenge with socialization where a person's world becomes smaller and smaller. And that person might become more and more isolated. Isolation is um, very much equal to decline for people living with cognitive change. Uh, there was an interesting study that was done many years ago that people who are more isolated tend to have a decline, health decline, that is equal to a person who could be smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So it, 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 isolation has a direct uh, result uh, on a person's health. And so we want people not to be isolated. We want people to continue to connect, to continue to uh, feel that they can socially be supported and understood and helped and seen um, throughout their life. And dementia itself, um, as a disorder, does not cause depression. And so that's something that's really important to recognize, where uh, depression is a different disease. It's a different disorder. And there are ways that we can treat depression, although right now there are no cures for uh, Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementias. Uh, there are uh, ways to treat a person living with depression. And a person living with dementia can also get depression, but it's not the dementia that's causing the depression. And so as care partners, it's important to understand that if we're seeing the signs of depression, uh, that we take that person to uh, a resource that can help them with that depression. Uh, neurologists state that the best response to a diagnosis of cognitive impairment or cognitive change is 90% psychosocial and only 10% medical or clinical. Okay, now that's huge. So psychosocial will learn exactly what that type of interaction is, what that type of um, response is to help build a person up uh, in all areas of their life, emotionally and supportively and socially. So we want to build bridges as care partners who see our loved ones uh, being challenged more and more because of what the diseases of dementia and cognitive change is doing to their brain, uh, limiting their capabilities of speech, limiting their capabilities of processing stimulation in the world around them, causing increased anxiety, uh, as we see all of these symptoms happening um, that burn that person's bridge to the outside world and make it more difficult for that person to interact. As care partners, we want to do whatever we can to build those bridges. Uh, and there are ways to do that through our interactions with each person, through our relationships and our connections and our engagement with that person. Some of the tools that we'll learn about today include just having the willingness, you know, to, to be with that person, having the willingness to see that person outside of the dementia box that says people with dementia do this or people with dementia act like this. Uh, we want to shy away from labeling a person based on a disease and placing them in a box and seeing that person for who they are according to their strengths their story, their capability, their abilities, um, who they are still while living with cognitive change. So just having that willingness to step up and say, I want to see you for being you helps connect you to them and provide so much uh, love and hope and care 
that, med that medical uh, processes alone cannot do. Um, so, so much of that willingness has to do with empathy, has to do with having patience, has to do with being a creative problem solver and having the understanding to say, I might not know what it's like to be in your brain or be in your world, um, but I'm going to do the best I can to get into your world, to have my world enter into your world so that I can try to understand you as best as I can and relate to you and bring a sense of, of love and care and understanding and empathy and patience um, to you um, from, from my world. And so that comes from us learning their interests, listening actively to them. Uh, as we know, words a lot of times become very, very compromised in that a person's language, they, they can't uh, find the word that they want to use. In a particular sentence, they'll say the wrong word. Sometimes it'll get to the point in their process that they'll they'll not be able to speak at all and they'll be um, speaking what is sometimes referred to as, as gibberish that they lose almost all access to language um, but if I listen actively and try to kind of be as Tipa Snow says a message detective knitting together the words that I'm hearing and the affect uh, the facial gestures that I'm seeing and the intensity of the words that they're saying and the rapidity of the words that they're saying. And I start to, to put together an idea of what they might be trying to communicate. That is me reaching again into their world and doing the best that I can to help them be seen and heard and understood in the best way that I can. And the only way that you can do that is by taking your time slowing down, listening, being that creative problem solver by trying different approaches uh, until something is successful. Um, and if it's not successful, trying again, trying a different approach, trying a new way, uh, sometimes just being still and observing and listening and watching to see what you can see and, and what you can experience through their own eyes and through their own abilities it's really important to recognize that that person is still there. You know, they're not an empty shell. That is a term that I've heard, unfortunately, many times in the past when there was lack of understanding about dementia and people living with dementia. Um, the person is still there. Their, their bridges to the world around them might have been burnt down because of the symptoms of dementia, but that person is still deep in there somewhere and we can find them um, and it'll be harder to connect to them, but we can, we can at least be that human connection, that human point of reaching out to them and saying, I still see you. I still know that you're there and I love you and I care about you and I'm here to help. So how do we build some of those bridges? We build those bridges through um, seeing their emotions, seeing their abilities, trying to understand their story, which for many adults living with cognitive change is by tapping into what they did in their life, uh, in their lives, in their livelihood, in their lifestyle prior to having dementia. So what was their career? How did they spend their time in the past? Who is um, who's in their family? Who's in either their birth family or their chosen family? Who is in uh, their life that has meaning to them? Uh, who is, you know, their, their mother, their father, their siblings, their children, their important friends? Who, who has meaning for them in their lives? And, and what does that person provide to them? What kind of meaning does that person provide to them? Um, either positive or, or negative. Um, these are all things that we should know so that we know uh, how to best uh, connect with them knowing their favorite foods, their hobbies, their interests, their favorite places to visit, knowing their favorite music. Music is a huge part of connecting to a person living with cognitive change, but it has to be the right music. It has to be the type of music that that person enjoys. 
Uh, we all have different music preferences. And before when I was talking about the dementia box, there's also sometimes the generational box when it comes to music is thinking about, oh, a person um, was uh, born in 1932 and every 89 year old likes this kind of music. Uh, that's not true. Uh, there are people who are in their 80s who like music from the 80s. <laughs> so there are people who are living in their 80s who like classical music, who like uh, more modern music, who like music from the 1940s. It's, it's everything is different. So every person has their own. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to knock uh, classical music or opera, but let's just say it's not my favorite music. And I know that if I did not have the ability to communicate that knowledge to somebody else, um, let's say if I did have dementia and I was placed in a room of music that I did not like, I would start to get anxious. I would start to get frustrated because I'd be hearing something that does not bring me pleasure. So it's important to know the type of music that that person likes because when we are play, playing music in that person's environment, we want them to enjoy that experience. So knowing the, their favorite music, their favorite artists, their favorite genre uh, of, of music or any type of preference, whether it's a, a reading preference, an audio book, an art preference, we want to know what they like and why. Uh, and then use those specific uh, tools to connect to them. So how do we also help that person feel relaxed? How do we help them feel comforted? Uh, living with cognitive change, living with dementia often creates more anxiety. Uh, the diseases of dementia tend to affect a person's brain chemistry in a way that creates more anxiety. And we see anxiety come up much more frequently in the lives of people living with dementia. Uh, we'll see uh, in sundown syndrome, if you're familiar with what's sometimes referred to as sundown syndrome or sundowning, uh, we see a person becoming more anxious towards the end of the day. And so if I know a person is feeling anxious and I'm seeing them act in ways that are appearing to be anxiety driven, what are some things that historically have comforted them? For me, it's a big fuzzy blanket. I love warm fuzzy blankets. That's one of my favorite things. Uh, and one of my ways that I really relax at the end of the evening, I, I'll lay on my couch with my big fuzzy blanket and just, just relax. And that helps me feel comforted. And so does your loved one have a big fuzzy blanket that they just love and it just feels great on their body? It brings them comfort. Um, is there uh, an animal in their life, whether it is a, a live animal or a plush animal, uh, that brings them joy, that brings them comfort? Are there pictures of people in their lives? Is there music? Is there something that really just helps them feel better when they are feeling stressed or when they are feeling anxious? It's really important that we know those things and that we communicate those, uh, those comforts to people who are interacting with that person on a daily basis. Because when maybe, maybe we're not there to communicate it, um, let's say if the person is living in a residential community, uh, so the staff who is working in that residential community should know uh, what, that per what brings that person comfort. Um, and if they don't know, then it's great for us as the caregivers to communicate that to them so that they have that in their bag of tools for when anxiety is popping up for that person. Also for us just to, to know what happiness looks like for that person. Um, I know when my loved one looks happy, they're smiling or they have that twinkle in their eye or they're, they're tapping their hand in just the right way or the, the words that they're using 
are heard in a way that sounds joyful versus sounds stressful. You know, what does happiness or the feeling of happiness look like to that person? And consequently, uh, alternatively, what does anxiety look like for that person? So how will I know when that person is stressed? How will I know um, when I should introduce that comfort item or when um, things are going well? You know, that's again, part of knowing that person to the best of our capabilities so that we can bring them the help that they need when they need it. And what does it look like they need or want? Um, how are they communicating what that want is? Uh, how do they communicate when they're hungry, when they're thirsty, when they need to maybe use the restroom or when they're lonely or when they're bored, um, when they're anxious? What do all of those states of mind and states of emotion look like for them? And so we'll know by their gestures or by their words or by the cadence of their words, by the sound, the intensity of their words or their facial gestures. Oh, wow, my, my mom, my, my loved one is anxious right now um, because she's doing this. And she only does that when she's anxious. So by knowing, knowing those things and being able to, to know them yourself so that you can then help that person feel comforted or communicate to the staff that is caring for that loved one in a residential community, um, how, how that person can now be comforted based on what you are witnessing and what you know about that person. So those, these are all so important bits of knowledge for us to have to help support that person and build those bridges that are many times burnt down, you know, through the diseases of, of dementia and cognitive change. So there are lots of ways to connect. Uh, listening, actively listening is probably the number one way to connect. Um, and it's not listening just to words. It's listening to tone of voice. It's listening to uh, the cadence of the words, how fast are they coming out, the loudness. Uh, for example, if a person at the, the near end stages of cognitive change um, who has maybe lost all words, maybe they're only able to say one word. And let's say that one word is need, you know, and they're saying need, 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 need. That word is going to be different or that emotion is going to be different than when they're saying need, 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 or need, 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 need. You know, you can hear the different types of communication, the different types of message that is attempting to be sent versus need, 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 need. So being with that person and knowing how they're communicating and the, the depth of that communication is again, so important. And I can't know that unless I choose to listen and focus on that person, focus on their feelings knowing that anxiety is common in dementia and to be comforting, uh, to let go of my needs and my expectations, my, uh, my worlds, let go of everything that I feel that um, I need to control or I need to see or I need to experience from that person and instead enter into the world of that person um, and just get to know them, see them as much as they can. Uh, acknowledge when they're upset, knowing it's okay to be upset, just as much as it's okay to be upset when you're not living with cognitive change, when you're not living with dementia. Every human being gets upset um, from time to time, as I'm sure we all know, and, and that's normal. So it's okay to be upset. It's okay to have um, emotions, good ones, not so good ones, comforting ones, not so much comforting ones. And we validate that person's emotions. We listen, we show interest, we show care. Uh, and we sometimes find ways to, to question, how can I help you feel less sad? How uh, I care about you, how can I help? I'm here, I'm listening. Uh, please know you're not alone. Please know that I love you. Uh, just saying sometimes things like this can be very helpful because the person wants to know that they're, they're secure, that they're safe, and that they're loved, um, as every person would like to know. So be here now. Be in the moment. Uh, I was uh, at a support group last night uh, speaking, 
and I was letting a, a person know who asked a question about where should you know where should I be with my expectations or, or of what what to see in my my mom when I come and visit and I say leave those expectations at the door just be in that moment right then and there with that person and that's the best place that you can be you know suspend your judgments suspend your critiques cherish the moment uh, if there's one so-called gift of living with cognitive change it's that the short-term memory disappears and pretty much that person is only living in that moment they're living here now this moment this minute uh, this second, uh, they, they sometimes can connect very well to, to 30, 40, 50 years ago, but are, are lost in, in where they are now, lost in time and place. And so being in this moment with them is one of the best gifts that we can give them, um, letting go of our expectations, our needs, um, and considering what that person might need right now emotionally. Uh, understanding that the needs go deeper than what the body needs or what the disease uh, might be doing to their brain or their capability, and just choosing to be with that person, listening, supporting, loving, uh, and several of the examples that I've already given, because time spent simply together is valuable. Because we're more alike than different. You know, we don't want to... Uh, only see that person by that dementia box. We want to see that person as the person of who they are, that person who's still there. And so bring it back down to personhood. You know, every person wants to feel loved or needs to feel loved. Every person wants to feel comfortable and comforted. Every person wants to feel safe. Every person wants to feel cared for. Uh, they want to feel recognized. They want to feel that there's things in their lives that they can love to do, that they can make a difference, that they're not alone, that they can be creative, that they can be curious, uh, that they can have what they need when they need it, that their voice matters. I mean, so many of these things are, are an integral part of, of who all of us want, you know, what all of us want um, as human beings uh, that would make us happy. And so thinking about the person living with with cognitive change, living with dementia is the same. You know, they also want to feel loved. They also want to feel known and understood and seen and recognized, knowing that they're not alone, knowing that their voice, whatever it sounds like and whatever the capabilities are, um, whatever they can do, they're being heard, they're being seen, they're being connected to, and knowing that every one of us can make a difference in some sort of way uh, through our own capabilities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Maria Montessori. And so Maria Montessori, oops, gotta go back, um, is um, you might have be familiar with her from the Montessori approach. Uh, so the Montessori approach is often used with uh, children. And you heard about the Montessori schools. And so the Montessori schools um, focus on engaging the senses, on engaging the person's capabilities, on engaging that person's um, interests in, in, in whatever they can do in that moment, and really focusing on the positive on that person, for that person, with that person. And so I'm going to actually stop my share so I can go back to that last slide. Here we go. Okay. So here we go. So here are some of the Montessori principles. Uh, that are also used with people living with cognitive change. When it comes to uh, engaging a person in an everyday activity or everyday lifestyle. So the activity that we do with that individual um, should show a sense of purpose where that person can um, have their interests captured and expressed, um, where we invite that person to participate so again, we're not doing things to a person. We're not doing things for a person. We're being with that person. We're including that person. We're inviting that person to participate um, in the, the experience. We're offering choice whenever possible. 
And, you know, we don't want to, of course, overwhelm a person with a choice, depending on a person's uh, stage in the cognitive change or in the decline that is happening with their, their disorder. Um, they might only be able to choose between two things. Some people are able to choose between three things. Uh, some people are able to, to make more concrete choices earlier on in the stages of, of decline uh, in the earlier stages. So we don't want to make a choice for that person as much as we want to offer choice um, to that person and say, hey, would you like to wear the blue pants or the red pants? Would you like the salmon to eat or the sandwich? Would you like to do a puzzle or would you like to go for a walk? Um, you know, living in the, making sure that that person has that opportunity to say yes or no, or, oh yeah, it's a nice day for a walk today. Would you like to join me? Um, I'd love to have you join me. We're going to talk a little bit more later about ways to communicate a choice to a person so that we don't only get no, you know, because there are sometimes uh, ways of communicating where we'll, we'll get shut down much more quicker than other ways. Um, and I'm gonna give you some tidbits on how to um, hopefully not be shut down as often by the ways we um, offer a choice. Uh, we wanna talk less, we wanna demonstrate more. We want to um, let that person know that we know we're here to help them do what they can do, that we're not gonna just do it for them. Um, we're gonna match their speed, we're gonna slow down. We're not going to expect them to go according to our speed or our comfort zone. And that's hard sometimes to slow down and just be, just, just be with a person and um, be in that moment. Sometimes we have such busy brains that are trying to get us to, to do, 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 and oh, what's on my phone and what's happening now? And, you know, our, our minds over technology and time have um, begun to spin faster and faster. And so we wanna uh, make sure that we get to match that person's speed and enter into their world where we're running at a speed that they can do, that they can relate to, that they don't feel overwhelmed with. And if I'm going too fast, that person can feel overwhelmed. So in me slowing down, taking some deep breaths and just enjoying the moment wherever it might be, as, as even as slow as it might be, uh, helps them feel more comforted. Uh, using visual hints and cues, uh, giving that person something to hold. Uh, again, comfort items could be helpful. Um, sometimes it's uh, a warm fuzzy blanket. Sometimes it's a, a plush animal. Sometimes it's a favorite photo. You know, um, whatever brings comfort to that person uh, can be helpful when a person is feeling more anxious. Uh, go, going from the simple to the more complex because we, we don't want to uh, infantilize a person. We, want, we don't want to assume that that person can't do or is incapable. So we never want to treat a person in a childlike manner or, or speak to them in a childish way. Uh, we want to maybe simplify, and any, by the way, any activity can be simplified, um, from reading the paper to doing a puzzle to doing a, a, a crossword puzzle or a word game or an exercise. We don't want to pick out activities that are childish, um, but instead use adult uh, leisure opportunities that uh, can be simplified. And, and I'll go into some examples of that later on. Uh, and, and if it looks like that that person's doing really well uh, on, on one level, on one simplified level, we want to add a little bit extra challenge and see, can they do, can they do more? You know, maybe, maybe we start off with a, a 25 piece puzzle, but then they, they did excellent at that. So then we move into a 60 piece puzzle and maybe they're really great at that. And we can do a 100 piece puzzle together. So, and maybe you know, it'll be the 60 piece puzzle. That's the best that they can do. And we're like, okay, that's it. It was, it was the 60 piece was, was their limit. And that was the most that they could do. And so that's where we stop. Um, so, so it's always important to, again, know that person's capability, know that person's um, 
level of comfort and, 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 and challenge. We don't want to be, you know, it's like the Goldilocks method, <laughs> you, I call it. You don't want to be too soft and you don't want to be too hard. You want to be just right, right there in the middle. Um, and then after the activity, you know, uh, we want to see, well, did that person enjoy this? Were they happy? Did they, do we want to do it again? Um, and understand that there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just being in that moment and, and, and connecting in that being with, in that relationship approach to engagement that makes, makes a big difference. So here are some sample activities. Um, and you'll see some pictures of some books or resources uh, in some of these slides. And at the end of this presentation, uh, I give you um, some more resources that you can go to uh, purchase for yourself if you would like, either through Amazon or, or another bookseller. Uh, but there are a lot of really good books out there that can really um, give great examples of some activities for people living with cognitive change. Uh, I guess, you know, we can't always, sometimes we, we run out of creativity. Sometimes we, we need that little hint to say, um, do this and, and not this, or try this, or, or don't try that. Um, so I have some resources that I'm suggesting at the end of this presentation. So here are some examples, um, tables with puzzles or other games, um, sorting um, for the more um, mid levels of dementia, where a person is losing uh, more capability, so sorting uh, activities are sometimes that are very helpful. Um, same thing for later stages. People who are living in the earlier stages of cognitive change might not feel sorting is their, their bag of tricks. They might feel a little, you know, like sorting is childish or not, not very helpful. Um, so again, knowing that person and, and knowing where they are uh, and choosing the right activity for, for that person um, is important. Cooking and baking. Uh, I love to bake. Uh, I love to cook. So it's one of my favorite things to do when I'm on, I'm working with a person who's living with cognitive change. If that's something that they love to do, I, I love, you know, let's, hey, let's make my world famous chocolate chip cookies today, step by step together. I can, you are an amazing baker, Mrs. Smith. Um, and so I, you can really help me. You can teach me. So show me what your favorite recipe was for chocolate chip cookies or um, can you, you know, I'll crack the egg, you mix the bowl, uh, you, uh, I'll measure it out, you pour it in the bowl, you know, again, involving that person in the, in the experience uh, is, is, is so valuable. Uh, again, sharing stories from that person's childhood, uh, if those are comforting stories, if those are stories that they can still connect to and love and appreciate, then, then yeah, let's let's talk about them. Uh, even if it's you've heard the same story seven different times <laughs> or 27 different times, then, then that's still okay. And again, that's where we have to be patient and, and being okay with that. Um, you know, as I said, sorting, um, card games, um, color, texture, all variety of different things that we can do. The whole idea is we wanna engage the senses and we wanna provide for a purpose. We want that person to feel that they are being purposeful. So um, again, here's a wonderful book. I talked about resources that you'll see. So Tom Brenner and Karen Brenner wrote The Montessori Method for Connecting to People with Dementia. It gives several examples of activities that you can do um, with a person living with dementia. And they talk about uh, using a demonstration and going at that person's speed, inviting that person, say, well, would you help me with, or I have this, um, I have this chore that I have to do, Mrs. Smith, and oh my gosh, I can really use your help. Uh, would it be okay if you joined me? You know, and, you know, so again, there's that way of communicating it where that person feels that they're needed. That, uh, that you need their help. And a lot of people are like, oh yeah, I would love to. I would love to be purposeful. I would love to, I matter. I still matter. I wanna be seen that I still matter. Uh, I wanna help, absolutely. Um, and so can you help me with? Uh, so there's again, some, a lot of really great um, examples of activities that emphasize community, that uh, help that person um, and live a life of respect and dignity and, and using their strengths and finding ways where that person can actually improve in their abilities, uh, of course, outside of 
you know, what dementia is doing to the brain, there are, there are ways that when we are engaging with a person in a certain way, we will see um, some improvement over time um, with their capability. It's actually called neuroplasticity and it can still happen uh, even with people living with cognitive change. So we need to give up control. We need to say, okay, this is not about me. <laughs> this is about you. Let me join you in your moment. Um, I'll be here by your side, you know, guiding, prompting, supporting, just helping make gestures, helping simplify and explain, but we're gonna go according to your pace, uh, letting go of what I expect to happen in the moment and watch what is actually happening in the moment and joining that person there. So I wanna ask, you know, I wanna avoid presumptions about that person's needs or preferences. I want to let them decide for themselves. And, and that's just part of, you know, just general respect. So these are just some examples of some ways that we can offer that choice. You know, would you help me with, or would you like this one or that one? And then actually show it to them. Would you like um, a drink of water or a drink of lemonade? Or would you like a, would you like, um, you know, the, the blue pants or, or the, the, blue jeans, or, you know, would you like to wear this sweater or that sweater or this blouse or that blouse? You know, it, it doesn't have to be complex. Um, wouldn't this look nice on you today? I think this would look great, you know? And then they could say, oh yeah, I, I would like that. That would look, I like that outfit or I like that blouse or I like that sweater. That's one of my favorite sweaters. Uh, again, um, now or later, will this, would you like me to you know, is now a good time to visit or should I come back in a few minutes? Uh, again, offering, um, including, so important for that person's respect and well-being. Uh, and again, if they cannot answer an open-ended question, you know, do you want to wear this one or do you want chicken or do you want to pet the cat? Uh, that will at least give them an opportunity to, to say yes or, or no um, without you know, shutting, shutting you down too much. So how do we ask? You know, we wanna uh, limit the opportunity for just no responses. Um, and when we limit the opportunity for certain no responses, it can lead to more yes responses. And that has to do with sometimes how we frame a question. Uh, like I said, uh, I, I could really use your help with, you know, sorting these flowers right now. You know, I, I wanna put these pretty flowers in a, in a vase and you're really great at flower arranging. So you, you have such a creative flair. Um, Mrs. Smith, could, could you help me? Uh, you know, or here's a, a red rose and here is my vase. Where would you put this red rose, Mrs. Smith? And then I'll hand her the rose. And because maybe she can't do the entire floral arrangement on her own, but she can do one flower at a time. Um, so, so those are just little tidbits um, on knowing that person's capability and breaking down the task in a way that they can, they can succeed and feel purposeful with. The other day I was doing a, a, a puzzle with a person living with cognitive change. And so that person was, of course, uh, in where she was in her later stages of dementia, unable to, of course, do the puzzle on her own. So I was sitting next with her and, and we were even saying, hey, you know, let's find all the straight pieces together. And um, I would point to a piece and I'd be like, does this look like a straight piece? Does this look like a piece that we can use? And she'd look at it and she'd be like, yeah, yeah, that looks like it. And so I would pick it up or I would go through the puzzle pieces and I would pick out the correct one and place it in the puzzle in just that the right place that it belonged. And I would say, Mrs. Smith, press right here. And then she pressed it right there and she saw that the two pieces clicked together and she was so excited and she was like, oh, wow. She just smiled from ear to ear. Um, so again, like finding the way for them to participate in the experience. Um, it's such a nice day. Wouldn't it be a great time for a walk? Would you like to go for a walk with me? That would be, I would love your company. Or here's a new game that I heard about. Let's try it together. Uh, I'm feeling creative. A new project um, would be nice to do. Let's try it together. Or join me for cards. I'd really enjoy playing cards with you if you're up for it. 
uh, you know, or, you know, I'm in the mood for carbs right now, you know, okay, let's, let's sit down. What do you, what do you think? And, you know, just again, like in welcoming that person, asking, um, showing that you, you care for their responses. Because purpose is power. So, you know, the word purpose uh, or purposeful means to find meaning, to be focused, to be determined, to have a reason, goal, or devotion to a cause. Uh, and everybody needs to feel purposeful. Uh, we don't want people to feel pur purposeless. We don't want people to be, again, feeling isolated, pointless, irrational, useless, or empty. We want people to feel that no matter where they are on, on their um, journey with cognitive change, that they're still being seen, they're still feeling heard, and that they do have some level of control in their life and that they're purposeful. So a person is living with dementia, so important of, to use the right words. Um, I, I, if there's one word that just strikes me every time is when I hear people say, oh, she's suffering with dementia. I'm like, oh, it makes me cringe when I hear that. Um, we don't want to focus on suffering because then that's sad and that's tragic. And, and then that takes away that person's um, any, any hope for positivity you know, and any option for, for still seeing strengths and capability. We want to focus on the person living right here, right now, even though they're living with dementia or even though they're living with cognitive change, their abilities and their strengths still exist, um, even amongst the challenges. Because um, the, as, as I'm sort of sure many of you know, the, the journey of living with dementia can be many years. It, it's it's uh, it's something that is um, happening over a long time, and so it could be ten to eighteen years. In some cases, twenty or more years. I've heard stories uh, of people's journeys, and so that's a long time. You know, we don't want to just assume that the person cannot do or is incapable. We want to see that possibility of capability. Um, throughout that person's life. Um, and, and that capability is going to be all different stages and all different abilities and all different uh, levels. Uh, but as long as we're there with that person right then and there, then we can um, see them for what they can do in that moment, um, even as that moment continues to change. So every single one of us has purpose in different ways. We all value different things. And that's important to know that person and what they value. Um, some of us love to travel. Some of us love to learn. Some of us love our animal companions, although that cat doesn't look too happy in that picture. So, but, but at least that person is. Um, and our, some of us love the arts, you know? So we're all looking for ways to express. And that's, that's just important for us to know what every person loves. So living purposefully uh, has many different categories, but these categories were actually written um, by Sherry Dupree, Dupree um, in her book, Just Dance With Me. And uh, the book was published in 2012. Um, and it's called Just Dance With Me, an authentic partnership to understanding leisure in, in the dementia context. It was published in 2012. And so these categories were identified through Sherry and many of the people that she was working with in her research. And she asked them, well, what, what is important to you in how you express yourself and how the lifestyle that you have and your livelihood and how you stay active um, in your, your leisure interests? And so the people who were in her study came up with different types of categories that uh, communicated their, their way of participating in the world around them and in their lives. And so um, some of these categories were called being me, you know, just individual participation in what's personally meaningful to that person, um, such as an individual pursuit, do things that they do by themselves, things that they, they enjoy doing um, personally, privately on their own that are expressing their personality or their interests. Uh, being with others, uh, connecting with, um, you know, with, with animals, with nature, with small groups of people, 
making a difference, contributing to the community or external partnerships or people outside of a residential community or outside of their home, um, friends, uh, social groups, uh, uh, fraternity organizations, churches, you know, making making a difference through through something, uh, social advocacy groups. Having fun. Uh, we all want to have fun. You know, we don't want to have life become boring or, 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 or way too serious. You know, we all need laughter in our lives. We all need delight. We all need to feel that we can play uh, even as, as adults. Um, maybe not in the same ways that we did as children because adults are, are different than children, but um, knowing that what makes us laugh or, or helps us be silly or helps us laugh or, or, or use humor or um, what do we find funny? You know, know, knowing what do we find fun and what do we find funny? Uh, knowing those ways that would make me smile a little bit more are so important. Um, again, seeking freedom, taking time to just relax, to take a break. We want that person to feel that they can relax, that they can have private time, that they can just take a breather and and not not be overwhelmed because it's very easy to get overwhelmed when you're living with cognitive change because of the changes that are happening in the brain finding balance in your life uh between keeping busy and having things to do and and just you know relaxing taking a nap um sitting outside and watching the the birds in the bird feeder or 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 um or the clouds watching the clouds pass by yesterday uh, there was this beautiful rainbow that was um, over by my house uh, after a rainstorm uh, that was there. And I was just staring at that rainbow. It was a huge, um, I could see the entire arc um, from end to end. And it was a double rainbow, which is basically the rainbow has, you can see the reflection in the sky. And if you've, this is a little rainbow fact for you. If you ever see um, what looks like two rainbows in the sky, the second rainbow on the outside is a reflection of the first rainbow. Um, and you will know that because the, uh, the colors are backwards. So um, you'll see uh, the, the last color on the first rainbow is the first color on the second rainbow. But you know, that has nothing to do with this class, but <laughs> rainbow science. Um, so I was just sitting on the porch, just looking at that rainbow. And I was just, I just felt so peaceful and so wonderful. And, Sometimes we just wanted to sit and, and watch and, and, and not do, and that's wonderful. Uh, and of course, growing and developing, whatever, whatever way we can continue um, to feel that we can continue to be challenged in the ways that, again, help that neuroplasticity, that help us grow, that help us learn, that help us continue to thrive um, and, and, and be the best self that we can be. Uh, you know, whether it's a fitness program or, or learning a new language or art history or learning a new skill. And, and, and as I mentioned before, all of these things can be simplified in ways that a person living with dementia uh, or living with cognitive change can do that. Um, so how can I, the question, the best question to ask yourself is how can I help this person live their best life, you know? Um, it's like I said, not only about the, the disease, not only about the symptoms of dementia, it's about, you know, helping that person live their best life where they are right then and there. Um, asking that person what they wish to do while you're together, asking uh, that person about their knowledge, their skills, what they can say or not say, what they remember, what they don't remember. Um, tell me about your career as a pediatrician. That must have been fascinating. And then, you know, maybe they'll be able to do that or, I've not had any luck hearing from my plants. Do you have any advice? Because you happen to know that that person was a master gardener uh, in their life. Uh, and so maybe they have some advice. Maybe they don't. Maybe they just want to help you water the plants. Uh, again, all things um, in all different ways. Um, what would, what have you always wanted to do? Maybe we can do it. You know, looking at that, there, there's this is for a person in the earlier stages. Did they have a bucket list? Did they have something they've always wanted to try? You know, again, being creative, creative problem solving and simplifying um, even, even what might appear to be the most complex task can still be done um, by a person who's willing to, to break it down enough to and, and connect to how that person is relating to the, those, those steps um, and see, you know, do you have to go faster or slower or, or what, what's working and what's not working. 
you know, there are ways to, um, to just watch that person and see, are you being successful now? Uh, and, and is it working? Because each day can have possibilities. Um, we, here are just some examples. All people, you know, in these photos are living with cognitive change. And um, in fact, the, the gentleman on the uh, far right of the screen with the beard and the glasses, he has his own podcast on YouTube and he goes all around the country. Uh, his name's Brian um, and Brian does presentations about living with dementia. He was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, uh, ooh, I wanna say like close to eight, eight years ago. It's, it's been a long time. I, I've um, seen him speak um, on multiple occasions and, and have um, been to conferences where he's spoken. And I, and, uh, I work on work groups with him for um, Dementia Action Alliance uh, where I volunteer. And so uh, Brian is like the dementia ambassador for Dementia Action Alliance. Uh, and so he talks about what it's like to live with dementia and he has this podcast and he has YouTube videos and um, I'd look him up. He's, he's really, really fascinating uh, and shows you that a person still living with dementia uh, can thrive and, and can do many quote unquote uh, regular normal activities that any other person can. It's just a matter of what they're capable and interested of doing. In, in, in doing, because we have possibilities each day. So I talked about psychosocial needs earlier. Here's a list of what some of them are, um, what those psychosocial needs are. Uh, it's assisting a person to meet their needs. Um, it's their emotional and their mental well-being. Things like intimacy, love, trust, joy, hope, belonging. And, and these psychosocial needs are just as important, if not more important, than a person's healthcare or medical needs. Uh, because if a person is not feeling emotionally well, it can affect them physically also. Um, and so by focusing on that person's emotional needs and meeting their emotional needs and building up trust and building up love and, and helping that person feel that they belong and they can feel joyful in that moment, it, it can truly help them in, in a myriad of different ways. So we take time to listen and connect, to validate emotions, um, knowing that anxiety is a common symptom of dementia, and it is often based on, uh, on like I said, those bridges burning in the brain um, through neurochemical changes in the brain where, where the person's uh, ability to truly understand um, the this, this stimulation that is happening around them um, the, the, the sounds, the, the, the sights, the, the views, um, the, the words, uh, it's harder for them to understand. And so when it's harder to either get words out or to understand words that are, are, are being you know, spoken to you, you tend to get a little bit more frustrated and you tend to get a little bit more anxious. So this is why we have to slow down um, and be in their world and not or not argue with a person and not correct a person, please do not correct your loved one. Um, please don't say, you know, if they say, you know, today is, is Thursday, don't say, no, no, today's Wednesday, you know, or, um, you know, oh, it's a, it's, it's summer outside. Don't be like, oh no, no, it's, it's, it's not summer, it's spring or, you know, whatever, you know, we don't, we don't have to correct that person. Just again, not not very important that they know what day it is. Not not very important that they know the exact the exact year or the exact season. Um, you know you know it's it's important that they're happy. Uh, it's important that they're they're less anxious. It's important that they feel comforted. That's really what's most important. So being in their world and not saying, oh no, that's not a picture of Aunt Mary. That's a picture of of Aunt Betsy. You know maybe they don't recognize Aunt Mary from Aunt Betsy anymore, but that's okay. You know that's okay. You know, be like, oh, okay, you know, who do you think that is? Aunt Mary, okay, that's fine. You know, you know, again, just helping them because there are certain things that we do just have to let go of um, in this person's journey. So 
we want to think again outside of that dementia box. Uh, we want to find ways, uh, instead of just finding ways to manage a behavior or, or care for that person's health care or physical needs, um, we want to help that person continue to thrive in all ways. Uh, we want to learn about how that person once contributed fully to life uh, and, and how can we help them find simplified versions of these things that they love to do and how they can continue to express their own knowledge and skills. Because life enrichment activity or life enrichment is, is a huge experience for that person. It involves a variety of different interests, um, reading, learning, music, fitness, volunteering, being, being purposeful, um, being with animals, being creative, uh, cultural arts, performing arts, crafts, games, puzzles, technology, gardening, socializing. Uh, we all have different things that are important to us. So just, you know, look at it, all the different ways that a person living with dementia could potentially find joy. It could be through helping um, a young one learn how to read, or it could be through volunteering, or it could be through gardening, or playing a giant chess game. <laughs> so there's many different ways uh, to, to find fun and joy in the world and purpose uh, and happiness. And, and that's what we really want to focus on. Because life enrichment, it's really about enriching lives. So we want to think can do. We want to think about the opportunity, the hope, the joy, the knowledge, the humor, the excitement, the growth, um, all the things that a person can do that is capable um, still um, outside of that realm of what's happening with their brain or happening with their body because of the diseases or disorders of dementia. We want to still feel that we can be joyful with that person, that we can laugh together, that we can be hopeful, that we can find opportunity, that we can find ways to learn, that we can find ways to be excited, uh, feel connected. So um, a person uh, who has, has many different ways of staying connected and engaged in the world, um, and there's three different components to what that term of engagement is, uh, and I'm going to go over each of these individually. Um, the, each, each one is life story, uh, is, is knowing that person's story, what's individualized to them, uh, that person's strengths and then finding support that can help that person um, be who they are. So um, let's talk about life story. So what is a person's life story? It's um, what makes them into their, that person, their individual, um, who they were um, personally, privately, socially. Are they an introvert or are they an extrovert? What achievements? Uh, do they have in their lives that, was, that they were proud of? Um, what significant roles they had throughout their life? What do they value? What did they value? How have those maybe values changed over the years? Um, you know, what did they do for work? What helped them make a difference? Um, how did family uh, serve in their life and their relationships with their family? How did their religion or their spirituality bring value to their life or continue to bring value to their life? Um, do they love nature? Um, what types of relationships, maybe outside of family, friends, work colleagues, um, what all people in their lives, who, who brought them value? Um, and and, and, and who, who are those people still around? And, and can they visit? And, and um, can they still have conversations with that person or just talk about their memories of that person? Um, what brings joy to their day? What makes them laugh? Uh, what, do, what do they like to talk about? So ask the person, uh, you know, themselves or ask the person who knows the most about them. Uh, it could be the, their caregiver. It could be you or just observe them and see what they're trying to communicate to you. So uh, what are that person's interests? How do they enjoy having fun? Uh, what, what is a challenge to them? Uh, it's important to know, like I said, their abilities, but also know their limits. So, so again, I can have that Goldilocks moment of, 
you know, what, what's too hard and what's too easy and, and have that just right, you know, right in the middle so that I know that they can feel comfortable enough to succeed. Uh, what are their goals? What are, what do they want to do with their day? What do they want to do with their time? Uh, what brings them energy, enthusiasm, curiosity? Uh, we want to see the person uh, beyond a disability. And so there's this whole uh, sense of uh, language and understanding in uh, the dementia friends community. Uh, and I'm a dementia friend. And uh, if you're interested in becoming a dementia friend, and I can always uh, and tell you all about that. There is a uh, dementia friends uh, group that will teach you about being a dementia friend and what that actually means. And they talk about seeing dementia not as uh, a disease, but instead as a disability. So when we see it as a disability, we, we are going to do whatever we can to accommodate that person. Again, it's the kind of the difference between uh, the terminology of a person suffering with dementia versus living with dementia. Um, words do matter. And, and, and the words matter in, in, in not only what we say, but those words will often reflect what we do, you know, with that person. Um, and so if I saw dementia more as a disability, I might see it more as I can build a ramp or I could um, help that person achieve. So um, through different things that I'm doing, different approaches that I'm doing, to help them um, best overcome the challenge in that moment uh, in whatever way they can. Um, whatever ways that I can support them. You know, how do I help this person be successful? What resources do we have available? Um, what is the environment like? You know, where, where are, are they living in a residential community? Are they living in the home? Do you have a, a private duty caregiver that's helping you? Um, are, are you a spouse? who's doing everything on your own, or are you uh, an adult child who's doing everything on your own? You know, whatever resources that are out there uh, can be added to your toolbox. Uh, it's again, really important to care for yourself in addition to caring, um, you know, having that caring relationship with your loved one. Uh, so, so what opportunities exist for us to continue to, to care? Uh, my, my dog's right here. If you might have heard her, she loves to to chat when when I'm on Zoom, of course. <laughs> so, so, um, so what other opportunities exist um, to help you know that person live their best life? Um, I always want to let that person lead in any way that I can uh, by by showing them that you know I'm here to to help them. Um, you know, be their best self to, you know, may, I'm not going to brush their teeth for them if they can do it themselves. Um, I might need to put the toothpaste on the toothbrush. I might need to um, pick out the toothpaste, the, the, the toothbrush for them and hand it to them. Um, but maybe they can put it in their mouth and they can do it themselves. So again, um, I want to let them lead and break the, the task down in the way that is um, more, most successful for them. And if it doesn't work, what can I do differently to make it work better? Uh, so support is also about um, finding uh, what the difference between procedural memory is and um, procedural memory are the things that we've done our entire lives, like the procedures that we've done, the routines, the habits, the skills, such as reading. Um, and these procedural memories, um, they are retained a lot longer in a person um, who is living with dementia. Um, it's the shorter term memories um, that do disappear a lot quicker, which is also called declarative memory. And that's recent events, facts, where things are. Um, these tend to be damaged a little bit earlier in dementia versus the procedural memory, the longer term memories, the abilities that that person has always been able to do for a long period of time in their life, they'll stick around a lot longer. Um, and so we also wanna focus on that person's strengths, what they can do well, um, where that person is still capable, uh, even if I'm providing them cues. Um, for example, they might not be able to wash their entire body, but they can wash their face. Um, they might not be able to use the stove, um, but they can slice vegetables. They can stir the bowl. They can set the table. Um, they might not um, be able to lift the garbage, but they can sweep up with the broom. Uh, you know, and so the, these are a variety of different things that we can, you know, uh, simplify or, or, or cue that person so that they can 
feel that they're participating uh, in some in life some way somehow um, on the in the ways that they can. Um, so wherever that person can connect, we want to again offer choice, offer inclusion, offer opportunity. So just here are some examples of different um, of, uh, areas of strengths that a person might have. Uh, a person might have motor strengths where they can use tools, where they can scoop, they can pour, they can stir, they can carry. And, and these are uh, physical abilities that, that do last a lot longer through the dementia journey. Uh, so uh, it's, it's sometimes not even up until the, the final stages of dementia that some of these motor skills are lost. Um, so that could be, again, like they can have this capability for 10 or more years um, in living with dementia. So again, we don't want to just do everything for that person or do it or do something to that person. We want to give them the opportunity to, to contribute um, in ways that they can. Uh, and uh, cognitive strengths are the, are the next category. Uh, so maybe they can read aloud. Maybe they do have some reading comprehension, which by the way, the ability to read does last a lot longer um, in the journey of dementia. Um, then, so the ability to read versus reading comprehension, reading comprehension kind of goes away um, in the, the moderate stages um, versus the ability to read. So I might um, say to a person, uh, what's a roller skate? And they might not know, but I could hold them up a picture of a roller skate and the word roller skate. And I'll say, what does this say? And they'll say roller skate. So, you know, again, it's the brain is fascinating um, in that, you know, all the ways that these changes are happening um, due to, you know, the, the disorders of dementia. And um, we need to, you know, find the, the best way that supports that person. Um, so other cognitive types of uh, strengths they might have, matching and sorting, counting, following directions. Um, maybe they can count to 20, maybe they can count to 10, maybe they can count to five, but however they can do it, um, we can do it together uh, and I can cue it with them uh, again instead of doing it for them uh, or, or assuming that they can't do it at all. There's also sensory strengths, you know, what they can hear, what they can see, what they can touch, taste and smell. And there are a lot of different sensory activities uh, that a person is, is still uh, able to, to connect to. Um, even in the, the most latest stages of dementia, the sensory uh, the, the sensory connections are still there. Uh, and then socially, through conversations, through humor, through giving their opinions, through, through listening, through leading, uh, these are many of the different categories um, where you can find ways to connect with that person. But we wanna go with their flow. We wanna try not to have the person feel put on the spot or tested. Um, we don't want to make it too challenging for them, but again, we don't want to make it oversimplified for them or childish or childlike. So we want to observe the person and have them um, show you what they can do. Uh, and then if they need an additional cue, we're there to provide that cue. Uh, so engagement includes the use of that person's strengths, uh, building up their some sense of self-esteem, uh, utilizing their story so that we are, are involving them in their identity in the experience um, where that person can continue to feel successful with whatever it is. So here's a person and it looks like she's washing vegetables. You know, maybe she's not able to cut the vegetables anymore, but, um, but she can wash the vegetables or she can um, maybe identify what the vegetable is and you can Talk about the vegetable, you know, oh, here's a carrot. Um, what color is, is the carrot? It's orange. And what animal likes carrots? Rabbits, um, guinea pigs. I actually have a rabbit and a guinea pig, so they both love carrots. Um, so again, just like knowing different ways to, to engage that person in the experience uh, of, of whatever activity you're choosing so that they feel that it has meaning for them, that they can be successful, that they, again, feel that connection feel that purpose. Uh, and engagement in meaningful activity, it supports independence, it supports choice and well-being of people living with dementia. Uh, it's all about uh, knowing that each person matters, that the person with dementia determines what's meaningful for them. 
just as much as all of us do. Uh, we all find things that are meaningful for us. Uh, and, and what's meaningful to me might not be meaningful to another person. So it's important to know uh, that individual. So think, take a moment now and just think about a time uh, when you recently saw a person living with dementia engage in a meaningful activity. Uh, how did you know that that activity was meaningful to them? Uh, what, what did it look like? Did, were they smiling? Were they laughing? Uh, did they have more eye contact? Uh, did they reach out for something? Did they, they reach for something that, that got their attention? Um, did they show interest? Uh, what do you think they, that you were doing that, in, that they engaged? Why do you think they engaged in that activity? Was it because it was uh, based on a, a part of their personal story or their individual history or uh, a hobby or an interest that they had uh, uh, in their lifetime? Um, what did you observe, if anything, that helped that person be engaged? Um, in what ways did that person benefit from the experience? So these are things that we can ask ourselves when doing activities with people uh, and, and say, hey, you know, she was really smiling when we did that puzzle together. She really enjoyed it. And when I think about her personal history. She used to love doing puzzles. That was one of her favorite things. Um, and so that's something that we can do together. Uh, but maybe she doesn't like crosswords, you know? And so we're well, never gonna do a crossword. I, I, I brought a crossword out and she showed no interest in it. She looked down, she looked away. I couldn't engage her. Um, and so uh, that activity, the crossword puzzle was something that she'd not enjoy to do. But the puzzle, um, was something she really enjoyed to do because she smiled and she had eye contact and she reached for pieces um, and she showed interest. So this is how I would sometimes know to do one activity over another. And we want to consider everything that that person can do, their strengths, their varying levels of strengths, their varying abilities. And I want to set that person up for success by limiting the amount of distraction in the environment, I want to make sure that there's good lighting uh, in, in the area, because if uh, a lot of people living with uh, cognitive change and dementia are older adults, and many older adults also have uh, vision issues, uh, macular degeneration, cataracts are all common uh, eye problems. Sometimes glaucoma happens as a person uh, ages. And so we, we don't want to have an environment that makes it more challenging uh, for the person. So we wanna make sure that there is good lighting, that there is not unnecessary noise going on, uh, that the person um, is, is listening um, and able to listen, that the person is not distracted or has a difficulty focusing. I wanna have everything in one area already prepared, all ready to go. Um, that way, again, less distraction. Uh, if I have to keep getting up from the table to go get something, go get the pencil or to go get the book or to, um, to go get something else, it, it, it creates more distraction for that person. Um, and of course, removing clutter. Uh, clutter in an area tends to be um, a bit more distracting for a person living with dementia uh, because they have a, a much la uh, lower ability to focus. And so if there's multiple things for their eyes to pay attention to, they're gonna be able to pay attention less uh, in the moment where you're trying to focus their attention. So uh, try to clear the table of anything that is uh, extra distracting um, and only put in front of you what you want that person to pay attention to. And, and demonstrate. And if it's something that you can create a template for, so like let's say if you want that person uh, to set the table, ha make up a little placemat that has, shows a picture of where the plate goes or where the spoon goes or where the fork goes. And all they have to do is, um, is copy that, uh, that, that picture you know, or match the plate on top of the picture of the plate or match the fork on top of the picture of the fork. And that makes it uh, again, easier for that person breaking down those steps. So here's an example of what I was just talking about. Um, where that there's a template and that all that person has to do is match that template and it makes it easier for them. 
Um, I also want to use contrasting colors um, because if you use contrasting colors, things will stand out a little bit more. Um, a lighter background with darker print or a darker background with lighter print. So um, either black on white or white on a, on a darker background keeps it very simple. Uh, I want to keep the environment relaxed and positive. I want to understand that challenges um, may exist due to physical or cognitive symptoms. And I want to you know, simplify it in the way that that person can have it simplified um, without it being too childish or, or too, too challenging, too complex. Um, look for ways to support that person um, who is now uh, appearing no longer interested, you know, that they look like, oh, now this is getting boring, bored. We've done this for the last 15 minutes. Um, I think I'm done. So, so watch their signals uh, in, in, in ways that then, okay, time to go to, to a different activity. Uh, or, you know, some people have different levels of, of attention span and they can do an activity for a half hour or, or 45 minutes. But um, for the average person uh, living with dementia, for, 45 minutes is pretty much the longest that you can go um, to do one, one particular activity um, before their focus starts to wane. Um, and, and so I want to understand that how I'm approaching that person is really important. Uh, assisting that person with the difficult parts of the task, uh, letting that person know that they're, that they're needed. Um, as I said in, in, in previous slides, um, could you please help me? Or um, of course, we're not gonna demand of that person, but we're going to invite them or ask them and, and, and see if that is an approach that works better um, for them. Uh, instead of just saying, hey, we're all going to um, go for a walk now, you know, and you know, just go and get them and, and bring them along, you know, give them a choice and say, would you like, would you like to come? It would be really nice to have you join us for a walk right now. And then that might be a way that the person might say, oh yeah, yeah, in fact, I would like to go. Um, so we don't wanna tell, we don't wanna um, you know, uh, demand or, or anything of a person, but we wanna always ask and involve um, and, and find ways to, to word the option so that the person feels included uh, and that they have choice. Other ways um, to approach that person is involving that person through conversation, um, substituting an activity for a behavior. So if that person is, let's say, rubbing their hands a lot or, or um, tapping a lot, you know, sometimes that happens in the later stages where a person will be clapping a lot or making certain noises a lot. Um, instead of just, you know, having them do the clapping, maybe I could put on some music and uh, their favorite music and, and it'll go from just making noise to clapping along with the music. And, and so, and we'll see these types of changes that happen when you are um, involving a person in, in choosing activities that work best for them. Um, and if it doesn't work, try it again later. Um, or, don't, or we now know that that's not something that is of their interest or of their preference. So we'll, we'll try something else. So here are just some examples of many different things that you could do. Um, and these are suggestions for persons in, in some of the later stages um, of cognitive change. Uh, smaller tasks, setting the dining table, baking bread together, humming songs, dancing, tossing a ball, uh, looking at pictures together, reading Dear Abby together, um, and offering and saying, well, you know, this person wrote into Dear Abby um, about this situation, what would what would you have done if you were in that situation, and and see how they see how they respond, see what they say, uh, and, and that could always lead to things that you never even knew um, about that person, their opinions, their thoughts, their interests, their their beliefs, um, and it becomes a really good conversation. There are certain times of the day that could be more successful than others. So there might be some activities that work better in the morning versus ones that work better in the evening. Uh, so, so here's just some examples of things that might work well in the morning versus in the evening. You might wanna have things that are a little bit more calm and relaxing, but we want a consistent flow to the day with some, uh, a bit of structure. Now, there's a difference between the word structure and rigidity. So we don't want 
um, a lack of, of, of flexibility. We don't want like, oh, you're going to, you are always going to eat uh, breakfast at 8 a.m. You know, every day we're going to have breakfast at 8 a.m. Um, well, maybe give them the option to have breakfast between 8 a.m. And, and 10 a.m., you know, but they can consistently rely on that breakfast will, will be during that time. Um, but it's, it's not a rigid, it's not 8 a.m. Or, or nothing. <laughs> so, um, so we don't want to be rigid. We want to be flexible. We want to be inclusive. We want to offer that choice. Um, and structure leads to reliability. So the person can rely on um, the morning meal of the day coming within this time of the day um, so they can rely on it. So they know they don't have to go hungry or they know that they, they feel like they're going to get what they want when they need it. Um, which limits um, the potential for anxiety. Uh, and then in the evening, uh, we, we can relax together. We can have some quiet time. Uh, we can start to get ready for bed so that that person can get some um, quality sleep, which quality sleep is a, a really hard thing to do um, as we get older. And then also uh, having, uh, having dementia or cognitive change impairs a person's brain in how they're able to get quality sleep. Um, and so making sure that, that we are offering an opportunity to, to relax towards the end of the day so that person does get some quality sleep is really important for brain health. Um, so by encouraging evening relaxation, uh, limiting caffeine and sugar to, to just the morning so that towards the evening, a person can more naturally relax. Uh, maybe keeping a nightlight would reduce uh, feelings of agitation or anxiety in the nighttime uh, if, if darkness seems unfamiliar to them, um, or if uh, the person is still capable of getting up in the middle of the night and going to the bathroom, but if it's dark, then uh, they can't see. So having nightlights in the room or in the hallway or having a sign on the door that says bathroom or a sign on the door that looks like the symbol, the universal symbol for bathroom, uh, girls' room versus boys' room. You can buy stickers to put on your bathroom door that look like that, um, that provide these wayfinding cues uh, to help a person recognize the difference between the closet and the bathroom, because sometimes they might not be able to do that. So if you put a sign or a symbol that looks familiar to them for the bathroom on the bathroom door, then it, it, it might limit the, the potential of them using the wrong room um, to relieve themselves. So all these tiny little cues can be helpful um, to that person's um, lifestyle and livelihood uh, so that they can continue to, to succeed even through the, the decline that they might be experiencing. Uh, similarly, back to evenings, we want to have a familiar setting where that person feels relaxed, gentle music, calming music, things that help them um, feel comforted, uh, that warm blanket, like I talked about for me, um, maybe it's a plush animal, maybe it's listening to um, relaxing sounds of nature or ocean waves. Uh, there are a lot of things that a person can get on their, on their uh, smartphone these days. Um, uh, I'm a fan of, uh, it's called the Insight app, um, and they have a whole lot of free music that you can play on the Insight, uh, Insight app, um, and it's completely free. Um, and so you can play that uh, on your phone uh, and help that person relax towards the end of the day. Let's talk about television. I need to take a break, for, uh, a breather for this one. <laughs> This is a lot of information I know. Um, I'm not a big fan of television. And why is that? Because a lot of times with dementia, a person cannot connect anymore to the, to the fact that television is fiction. And over the years, um, television, the, the speed of language coming out of, um, of a television program uh, and the uh, intensity of emotion in television programs has become much more intense uh, and, and causing much more anxiety, particularly on the news. Um, and if, if anybody here watches the news more regularly, like you know CNN or, or Fox News or MSN, 
the intensity of the, of, of the, of the presentations. It's like, and here's something you need to be really afraid of. And here's something else you need to be really afraid of. And oh my God, this is happening. And oh my gosh, this is happening. And um, it, it, it almost, it tries to make a person upset or, or, or tries to make a person worried. And the last thing we want to do is, is have a person living with dementia be more worried um, and have more anxiety. We, we do not need that. Uh, that is not a healthy mental environment for a person living with dementia. Um, and so there are certain things that we might need to say goodbye with, or at least very much limit um, for a person living with dementia. And, and certain television shows might be it. Um, I've heard stories where people are watching TV and they don't know that the show that they were watching was a fictional show. And later in the day, they turn to their loved one and say, hey, do you know someone was murdered here earlier today? Um, someone, was, someone was murdered. Um, or they're going to tell you the story about the murder that they saw or the, and, and it turned out that they were watching a, a crime drama on TV and, and they thought it was real. Um, and now they're upset because of the murder that they heard about on TV um, that they didn't know was fiction. Uh, it, it, these things literally do happen. Uh, and, and so we need to, to truly limit, um, you know, certain things in a person's life that could create more anxiety or could create the potential for frustration or, or, or disturbance, um, or sometimes even hallucination or, or, um, paranoia or suspiciousness in, in sometimes television shows, uh, can do that for a person living with, with dementia. So these are kind of my, my top three uh, measures of if television is right for that person. Uh, number one, are they paying attention? Uh, are they connecting to the story? Uh, do they know it's a story? Do they know that's fiction? Do they know it's not true? Um, and are they awake? So if they're you know, sitting on the couch and they're you know, asleep and the television's on, turn the television off. It's, it's just not helpful. Um, put something relaxing on. There are uh, relaxing television shows that are much better to watch uh, for a person who has dementia, like nature shows or, um, you know, uh, a music program that, that is of their favorite music. Uh, you know, things that are more pleasant to watch, um, things that go at a slower pace. Uh, the, those types of shows, again, as long as that person is able to pay attention and connect to it, um, that they know it's a story, that they know, um, you know, that it brings them joy, um, that they can stay awake throughout, throughout it, and th that that would be a sign that, yep, this works for them. Um, but if it's something that they don't understand or that they don't realize is, um, it is a television show versus what's happening in, in, in reality, uh, then it might not be helpful. And, and so it might be time to, to just turn it off. So activities are about creating connection and not just passing time. Uh, television is sometimes just about passing time. And we don't want to, we don't want to just simply pass time, but we want to have uh, engagement that is meaningful to that person. So here's just some examples um, of the different categories, the different dimensions of wellness uh, that a person uh, can engage in. Uh, social activities, physical activities, spiritual activities, uh, environmental, uh, intellectual, emotional, and I've given some examples of these already. And these are called the seven dimensions of wellness. So for example, physical activities, exercise, uh, yoga, uh, you know, deep breathing, meditation, going for walks, uh, social, um, being with with people that they love or family members or going to your, your favorite day program, um, emotional, doing things that bring you joy, occupational, doing things that bring you a sense of purpose, um, volunteering, setting the table, sweeping up or collecting plates after the meal, folding the napkins, uh, setting the table, helping in a baking activity, all of those things could be occupational. Uh, intellectual reading, uh, reading aloud together, uh, 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 trivia, um, uh, listening to, to your favorite music um, can sometimes be intellectual and emotional, um, spiritual, uh, whatever religion that person um, is or, or whatever spiritual um, 
joy they have or expression they have in their life, uh, doing activities around that. Uh, environmental, gardening, going outside, uh, getting some fresh air, sitting on a porch and just watching the rainbow. Um, all of these things um, can be helpful. There's just some examples. Because essentially everything can be an activity. Uh, we don't want to limit um, anything. We don't want to say, oh, it, it only has to be art or, oh, it only has to be uh, reading the newspaper or, oh, it only has to be bingo. Um, there are plenty of people in this world that do not need to play bingo, and do not want to play bingo. Um, so again, know that person. Don't just assume that, you know, oh, oh, older adults love to play bingo. Um, nope, maybe they don't. Maybe, maybe they'd rather do gardening. Maybe they'd rather do singing. Maybe they'd rather do exercise. Maybe they'd rather do a walk. Um, you know, find, find what works best for them. Uh, it's mostly about coming together and spending that time together. Because modification might be necessary. So we're gonna, you know, be where they are, see where they are, let go of our own expectations, see the moment, not the outcome. We wanna invite the person, we wanna show appreciation, and we always wanna thank that person for their help. Because people might not remember what they did, but they might remember the feeling behind it. They'll remember that when they spent time with you, that they were joyful. They remember that um, when you came to visit, you were a kind person. Um, they, rem they might remember that you were a friendly face. They might not remember exactly who you are, but they might remember that you, know, you were loving, you were kind, and it meant, it meant that they were safe, and meant that they were happy, and, and that was important. Um, so, so we want to connect to a person emotionally uh, and, and, and help them continue to express and find joy with who they are every day. Because our lives are meaningful together. There's that connection, that human beingness um, of, of togetherness that uh, helps a person feel loved and, and cared for and supported and understood all through the ages and stages uh, and cognitive changes of a person's life. So here are some examples of resources, um, some books that I recommend. Uh, uh, so if you are familiar with the best friends approach to Alzheimer's care, um, it is a, a approach that was created by Virginia Bell, who's a social worker, and David uh, Troxel. And they wrote uh, these books on being a best friend for a person living with dementia. They have really great resources. They have activity books, um, both a volume one and a volume two of suggested activities that you can do with a person living with dementia. But again, we don't wanna assume that just because the person has dementia that they wanna do these activities um, because they might wanna do different ones. Uh, but, but getting to know that person and finding ways to simplify those activities um, according to that person's preferences. Um, so these are just some tools and tidbits that you could possibly use. Um, and their book, A Dignified Life, um, is very helpful. And one of my favorite quotes from their book um, is that when your loved one might not be able to recognize you anymore, like let's say as the daughter or as the son or as the spouse, um, they might just recognize you as being their best friend. And, and that is truly what might matter the most. Uh, and, and so a new book that came out by Rachel Wonderland, and she has um, podcasts and she has um, uh, qu free question and answer sessions that she has online. She has a very big social media presence and an online presence. Uh, and so she has a book called Creative Engagement, and it's a handbook um, of activities that she suggests. And a classic book that's been around um, for quite a few years, I wanna say it was published in the 1990s, is called Creating Moments of Joy um, by, by Jolene Brockley. And she has a lot of really great uh, information about living with dementia, uh, as well as uh, helping a person live their best life with dementia. And so these are just some examples of resources that you could find. Uh, all of these books are available uh, on Amazon. Uh, and I have them all too. <laughs> so. So let me know if you want to borrow one. 
All right, so now we're up to the questions. Um, I really appreciate you listening to me for these uh, last hour and 45 minutes. Uh, and now we have about 15 minutes for questions. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna go to the Q&A and um, answer any questions that can be helpful. All right, thank you so much, Pamela, for all the rich content that you provided just to help everyone just really be in a place of just finding activities and ways to engage. Uh, for those that don't know me, I am Marquita Brown. I am the uh, Outreach and Support Coordinator for Inside Memory Care Center. So thank you so much. And we do have a lot of questions for you, Pamela. So I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay. Sure. All right. So the first one, um, I'm going to ask that the individual that send it um, give some clarification that asked about the Building Bridges screen. Um, and so I'm not sure exactly what they wanted to ask about that. So hopefully they'll respond back and we can go back to that one. All right, the next one asks, when you say let go of my needs, when my loved one is visibly not clean, trying to deal with hygiene issues, addressing the need, or is that a valid thing to address and push about? That's the question. Wow, I can do another whole webinar <laughs> about um, daily care uh, routine and, and, and how hygiene is really important. And so the answer is yes, it's important. And how important it is um, to the root to the um, the daily routine is where sometimes we do have to back away. So maybe we want to say that we feel, uh, according to our expectation, that person should be taking a shower every day. But maybe taking a shower is so traumatic for that person because there is actually um, a lot of things that go into um, having a shower that can be very overwhelming. Uh, and, and dis disruptive for a person living with dementia because of the sensory issues that happen with the brain changes, where the, the sound of the water, the removing of one's clothes, the um, sometimes the coldness, the temperature changes in the room between the water temperature and the, and the, and the, the outside of the water. Um, you know, the, the feeling of the water on your skin, um, older skin uh, is a lot more um, frail. And so sometimes just feeling that the sensory on the skin can be very disturbing and frustrating. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for, for confusion and stress and anxiety in, in, in the shower routine. And so um, there are going to be, pick your battles. Sometimes that, yeah, um, a shower every day is just not going to work. It's just way too traumatic for that person. Um, but maybe a shower twice a week is, is the best that you can do. And then you, you work maybe with a dementia specialist like myself or somebody else who can help break down um, that routine for you um, to make the shower experience more comfortable or, or work with a healthcare professional that can show you how to do a bed bath. Uh, and, and show you how to make the, the bathing experience much more comforting for that person. Um, and there are a variety of different tips and techniques. Um, so yeah, so when I say let go of expectations, it, it would be more of kind of what you expect to happen in that moment versus you know with a, a social activity um, and how that person is gonna participate in that social activity versus a hygiene experience because we don't, you know, health and safety is really important and we don't want a person to have skin breakdown. Uh, we don't want a person to be walking around um, uh, with, with hygiene issues that could lead to infection. Um, so all of these things are, are yes, there are, there are limits to, to sometimes where you will have to um, step in and, and say, okay, well, maybe they can't do a shower today, but I can at least do um, a sink wash up with that person that is gonna be a lot less stressful and at least lead to better hygiene um, for that person. Thank you. The next question says, what would you suggest for someone who is pro um, whose primary activity was shopping? Um, they no longer are comfortable leaving their apartment and they never used to, you're ne they never were used to using a computer or a smartphone. 
Um, so that's a that's a great question. Sometimes if they love to shop, we could shop inside of the home or we can talk about shopping. We can collect catalogs. Um, we can shop with catalogs. We can look at some of these catalogs together and say, oh, well, you know, this blouse would look really nice on you. It, it's your color. You know, would you buy this blouse or does this blouse look pretty to you? Um, you know, is this what what were some of your favorite stores to visit and maybe do a reminiscent activity with stores that are no longer um, existing, you know, for all of us that grew up with Montgomery Wards and used to go to um, to Montgomery Wards and yeah that that store doesn't exist anymore and just finding ways to engage that person in conversation um, through through reminiscing through catalogs through um, you know, I'm not a big fan of QVC, but if that's something that that brings, again, using my television rules, uh, engagement to that person without creating some sort of disturbance or anxiety, then maybe that could be a tool. Um, find just finding a way to engage that person, and then maybe finding different ways um, to engage that person outside of just the shopping. Maybe it's things that they like to do around the home. Maybe they were a homemaker. Maybe they want to help prepare for lunch and help you make a sandwich or help you sweep up or help you set the table. Finding just things that are maybe not, not traditional leisure activities, but are just daily lifestyle activities that that person can still do. Thank you. Um, this is similar to one of the other questions, um, but it says, how do you deal with hygiene with someone who is very resistant to help, but isn't capable of self-care um, any help leads to anger, you know, tears and things of that nature. So if there's anything you wanted to add in reference to that. Um, breaking it down into what's most simple and what's more welcome for that person and what's more comforting for that person. Um, so, so yeah, there's, I can do a whole webinar about, about hygiene and showers and, and the experience of the shower and why it can be stressful and, and, and different tips and techniques, but um, I would definitely say breaking it down in, in ways that are capable for them that they feel comforting. The use of music, comforting music, classical music, aromatherapy is also something that's been used um, around hygiene time to just create a, a pleasing experience. Um, there are some times that people have been bathed fully clothed. Um, so, you know, they're in a, they're in an undershirt and they're in their, their shorts, their boxers or their underwear, because it's just too disturbing for them to get nude. Um, but you know what, it's, it's better to be bathed even in your underwear if, if it's still a bath. Um, so, so sometimes just again, finding those ways that you can connect to that person and help them succeed wherever they are, um, whether it's a bed bath or a sink wash up or, um, bathing only twice a week. Um, bathing in a way that, that they feel that they can contribute, you know, um, give them, of course, their privacy, giving them the, the opportunity to, you know, would you like to wash your face? Here's the washcloth that has soap on it. How about you, you know, wash your face and you, you do that gesture, you demonstrate it for them and then they can mimic you. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of steps that sometimes go into the bathing routine to make it much more um, pleasing and accepting for a person living with, with dementia. Thank you. And we have another um, kind of scenario, um, it's more specific. My mom spent her life taking care of people, her children, other elderly people, and a disabled husband have not been able to get her to do any activities. What is it that she can do? So finding ways that she can still connect to, it sounds like she was a very caring person, someone who was, you know, a, a caregiver of many, many others in their, her entire life. And so being purposeful is really important to her. Um, so finding uh, a way to interact with her where she feels that she can be purposeful, um, whether it's you're going to, you know, uh, I could really use your help with, with this. Um, you know, you are such a loving, caring person. You cared so much um, for, you know, growing, you know, growing up. I know you, you cared for everybody. And now I'm, I'm here to help you um, be, be cared, you know, give care to you or, or with you. I want to engage with you um, in, in your own care. And so can you help me, um, you know, with this task or um, I, you know, you're such a wonderful person. Tell me the story about the time you spent with 
um, so and so and and use it as a reminiscence opportunity or help me fold these towels or or help me set the table or help me make this meal um, just doing something that that person can feel purposeful in their life and continue to be seen and heard and understood and and engaged in in in, in something that maybe it's not a leisure activity maybe it's a way that they can just continue to feel that they matter um, and maybe that's that's that that's it Thank you. The last question that I have here um, says, what are better ways to talk about cognitive decline than saying suffering with dementia? Um, yeah, don't say suffering dementia. <laughs> so you, number one <laughs> rule, um, sticking to the positive, sticking to who that person is um, with or without the, the disorder. Um, I'll give you a good example. If a person gets cancer, we're not always bringing up that cancer, are we? We're not saying, oh, well, you're a person with cancer, you know, hey, let's take the person with cancer to the store. You know, it's it's like, no, we're going to the store. <laughs> so so whether it's it's living with cancer or whether it's living with dementia, um, the disease itself doesn't necessarily matter. You know, it's the quality of life that matters. It's it's them being who they are and continuing to feel that they can be who they are and that they can be happy and then they can feel loved and they can feel cared for. Um, the diagnosis is really only important on a medical chart. You know, what's most important is, is how that person is getting quality of life uh, and enjoyment every day. And, and yeah, I would never bring up to a person that they have dementia because that can only bring up grief and mourning. So it's not going to be like, Mom, remember, you can't remember because you have dementia. No, don't say that. <laughs> so don't, don't do that. You know, do, you know, just just be in the moment and, and, and be OK with however they're showing up in that moment. You don't have to remind them about their their inabilities um, or, or their diagnoses. Just be where they are in that moment with them, for them, around them, with them it is so important. Absolutely. We do have one additional question. Can you elaborate more on the Insight Music app? Oh, yeah. So grab my phone. <laughs> so it is, I have Android, um, but here, let me, oh, let me open it up. It is, I believe, called Insight Board. Insight Timer. I stand corrected. It's a picture of a bowl. <laughs> so Insight Timer. I'm going to hold it up. There it is right there. Looks like a little bowl. Uh, and it's called Insight Timer. And, you know, I don't know what phone you have. It's whether it's an Apple or an Android or Google Play or I, iTunes or whatever. Um, yeah, it's on. It's available on Apple as well as uh, Android. And it's free. They do have a membership um, if you want, like, full access to everything. But their access to everything is classes. Uh, everything, you know, if you're not interested in classes, so it's like you don't want to take a 10 day meditation class um, and you just want to listen to music, you can listen to all the music you want for free. Uh, and, and it doesn't cost it doesn't cost anything, but the, the classes are part of their membership program and they do not pay me to give them their commercial. <laughs> so I use it myself. I love it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, definitely a lot of good information. And um, if anyone um, has any follow-up questions that they need, just please feel free to contact myself or Lindsay, and we'll make sure you get the content, content that you need. Also, since Pamela was so good to mention um, the dementia-friendly Fairfax, um, we want to make sure that um, you, um, Lindsay was not, um, great enough to put it in the chat. Um, Lindsay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, and then you can close us out. All right, thank you, Marquita, and thank you so much, Pamela, for being here today and just sharing just, just the tip of the iceberg with your experience, right? We've picked up so many great tips and strategies from communication to life story to wellness to TV and all, everything in between. So thank you so very much for being here today. And I want to thank all of the caregivers who are listening in today at this webinar. We really value your feedback. There will be a survey that pops up after today's webinar. And there will also be a follow up email that comes out tomorrow with another opportunity to complete the evaluation. So please do let us know what was the most valuable parts of this webinar, anything that you'd like to see in the future. We really appreciate your feedback as we serve our community. 
And if you'd like to learn more about Insight or see our upcoming classes, which include the Dealing with Dementia workshop on Wednesday, September 1st, and September's class for caregivers, which is about understanding care options, that's on Wednesday, September 8th, please find those on our event calendar. Insight also offers a variety of memory cafes, support groups, uh, early stage programs, and other opportunities to support you and your family. So if you're interested, please contact us to learn more. If you'd like to support Insight, we do offer a variety of options to support our mission from monthly donations and vehicle donations to Amazon Smile and even workplace giving. And if you'd like to follow what we're up to, you can find us on social media, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And uh, now we've got the phone number and the website up on the screen. So if you do have questions after today's class, please do reach out to us at Insight and we are happy to be a resource to you, your family, and your community. So thank you all for being here today. And again, thanks to Pamela and my colleague, Marquita. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, bye-bye.